Hello Flight Simmers and welcome back to Alpha Hotel Flight Simulator Training. This is Lesson 10 in our VFR or Private Pilot Level Training Series. In the previous two videos, we've been talking about how to navigate primarily by looking outside the aircraft, but in this lesson, we'll start talking about some of the electronic forms of navigation we can use. This lesson will focus on navigating using VORs, which are the most common form of electronic navigation you can use in the Cessna 152. VORs were the primary method of electronic navigation for pilots between the 1960s and the early 2000s, before the use of GPS became commonplace. Though the FAA has reduced the number of VORs in the United States over the course of the last decade, it plans to keep a minimum network of 589 stations to serve as a backup for the GPS system well into the future. This network will allow VOR navigation in most areas of the country above 5,000 feet AGL. So VORs will be around for a while yet, and it's a good idea to learn how they work and how to use them. VOR stands for VHF, Omnidirectional Range. VHF means very high frequency, which is just a reference to the radio frequencies these stations inhabit. VHF frequencies are the ones you can find between 30 and 300 megahertz, and you'll find the VOR frequencies just above the FM commercial radio stations between 108.0 up to 117.95, although they do share some of that space with the navigation transmitters for instrument landing systems. It's also worth noting that the voice communication frequencies of the aircraft's radios live just above the VOR frequency range between 118 and 137. If you could dial an FM radio's dial or tuner just beyond its normal range, say up to 110.4 if you're driving through West Central Arkansas, you'd be able to listen to the Morse code identifier for the Fort Smith VOR. Transmissions from VORs have a range of up to 40 nautical miles if you're at least 1,000 feet above the station's elevation, and that increases to 70 nautical miles if you're at least 5,000 feet above the station's elevation. There are also high-altitude VORs with greater range above 14,500 AGL, though that won't matter too much in our little 152. You can also get signal reception further out than the official service volumes and the range of VOR transmissions in flight simulators seems to be even greater than in real life. VOR transmissions are also line of sight transmissions, meaning if there is a large mountain or other obstacle between you and the VOR station, you're not going to be able to get the signal even if you're at a relatively high altitude. So what does a VOR do? VORs are radio stations that send out 360 radio beams, called radials, that radiate out from the VOR like a fan in all directions. The radials are numbered based on the direction they travel away from the station. For example, the 090 degree radial is to the east of the station, whereas the 270 degree radial travels west from the station. The 230 radial is southwest of the station, where the 045 degree radial is to the northeast of the station. A pilot can use these radials to determine their position relative to that station, navigate to that station, or navigate on a specific radial to or from that station. Since radials fan out from the station, they get further apart as they get further from the station. The distance between radials depends on your distance from the station. At 60 nautical miles from the station, each radial is one nautical mile from the next one. So at 30 nautical miles, there's a half mile distance between radials and a quarter mile distance between them when you're 15 miles from the station. There are three different types of VORs located on sectional charts, but the navigation function for each one works the same. Basic VORs are depicted with a hexagonal symbol with a dot in the middle. The ones with boxes around the hexagon are VORs that have distance measuring equipment, or DME. This is a system that tells you your distance from the station, as you might imagine, but you have to have DME equipment installed on the aircraft for it to work, which the 152 does not. When the VOR symbol has shaded areas on three of the hexagon's leg, this indicates that the station is a VORTAC, or a VOR TACAN. This is a VOR that is co-located with a military navigation system called a TACAN. 
For civilian users, this just means that we can use the TACANS DME function if our aircraft is so equipped, which again, we're not in the 152. So all three types of VORs function exactly the same for the purposes in this lesson. Each VOR will have a blue box located next to it or near it that uh, has information about the VOR. The information above and below the box is information about flight service stations you could use in the real world, but these are not emulated in Flight Simulator. The other information in this box includes the name of the station, the frequency it transmits on, the three-letter identifier for the station, and the Morse code for that identifier, which you can listen into and make sure that you have the right station dialed up and that it's operational. For example, with Hallsville, it tells us that the, I, the name of the station is the Hallsville VOR. It transmits on a frequency of 114.2, but that's... Uh, so that's what we would want to dial our nav radio into if we want to use this VOR. The channel information just indicates that it's a Vortac and that it has a DME. There's nothing that we can do as civilian users to use that channel. Uh, HLV is the three-letter identifier. That's what you'd want to put in a GPS if you want to navigate to that VOR or put on your flight plan if you wanted to uh, file that as part of your flight plan. And then the dots and dashes are what you would uh, hear if you actually listen into the VOR. Uh, you can listen to that and you can tell what the Morse code is going to sound like by looking at this and know that you have the right station dialed up. They should always be operational in Flight Simulator, but in the real world, when VORs are undergoing uh, maintenance, they will actually remove the identifier, so that's a signal to pilots that you should not use that station. Each VOR symbol on a sectional chart is surrounded by a compass rose. There is a long arrow that goes from the VOR symbol to the compass rose that points to magnetic north. There are small tick marks that are demarcated in five degree increments, and then the larger tick marks are indicating 10 degree increments. Uh, numbers are marked every 30 degrees, and there's also a small arrow at those points as well. And just like with uh, runway numbers and heading indicators, the last zero is left off to save space. So in other words, the three up here actually indicates the 0, 3, 0 degree radial. And then over here, the 3-0 actually indicates the 3-0-0 degree radial. Blue lines coming off the VOR indicate uh, Victor Airways, and we'll get into that a little later in the lesson. So let's take a look at the onboard equipment. The VOR receivers are located to the right of the communications radios, with the top radio being nav number one and the bottom radio being nav number two. As far as tuning and frequencies, they work exactly like uh, the communications radios. You have a standby frequency on the right-hand side and an active frequency on the left-hand side. Uh, in order to tune the radios, you tune them exactly like you tune the comm radios. The big number does, or the big knob does uh, the big numbers, and the little knob does the little numbers. And once you have the frequency that you'd like to use dialed in there, just push the white button with the black arrow and that will swap them out and put the what was in the standby in the active. Uh, you can use the nav 1 or the nav 2 buttons on the audio panel to listen to the radio uh, for the Morse code identifier for the VOR station uh, to make sure that you're receiving it and to make sure that it is the right station and that it is operational, although they should always be operational in Flight Simulator. While this is a good habit in real life, and you can do it in other aircraft in Flight Simulator for realism, I don't recommend doing it necessarily in the 152. And the reason is that there doesn't seem to be a way to turn the uh, listen buttons off. Uh, so once you have them on, they're going to stay on, and it would be a bit maddening to listen to the Morse code for the entire flight. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to do that in the 152. So let's take a look at the VOR indicators. The VOR indicators are located to the left of the radios and to the right of the flight instruments in the 152, with the top one belonging to NAV1 and the bottom one belonging to NAV2. Their technical name is omni-bearing indicators. The big circle on the center of the display represents your aircraft. The white line that runs horizontally across the display is only used to display the glide path on an instrument landing system or ILS, so we won't be using that in this lesson. When you're not receiving an ILS 
this line will stay centered in the middle of the display and the black bi-directional arrow symbol with the red background located on the right side of the indicator will display to indicate you are not receiving a glide slope signal. The white line running vertically in the display is your course deviation indicator or CDI, also sometimes called the needle, and it indicates your position left or right of your selected course. The line is the course that you want to fly, while the big circle is your aircraft. There is also a bi-directional arrow symbol at the bottom. When you're not receiving a valid navigation signal, this symbol will display and the CDI will center. When you are receiving a valid nav signal, this symbol will not display. When you're receiving a valid sig nav signal, the letters NAV will also appear in green at the top left corner of the nav display. The little dots placed horizontally on the display represents your deviation from your selected course in degrees. When the CDI is on the outside edge of the circle, this represents a course deviation of two degrees, and each dot left or right of that indicates two more degrees. When the CDI gets all the way to the left or right of the display, this is called a full-scale deflection and means you are 10 degrees or more off your selected course. The dots that are placed vertically depict a deviation from an ILS glide path, and again, we won't be covering that in this lesson. The compass rose on the outside of the display is called the Omni Bearing Ring and is how you select what course you want to fly. Like the compass rose on the map, the little tick marks are 5 degrees and the big ones are 10 degrees, and just like on the rose or your heading indicator, the numbers are marked every 30 degrees and the last zero is dropped off to save space. So for example, the 6 here represents dialing in the 0, 6, 0 degree radial and the 2, 4 represents dialing in the 2, 4, 0 degree radial. The little arrows at the top and the bottom of the ring mark your course selections. The little knob labeled OBS is called the Omni Bearing Selector and is how you move the Omni Bearing Ring to select your course. At the top right of the display is the To From indicator. It displays an up arrow with the word To if your selected course will take you to the station and a down arrow with the word From if the course would take you away from the station. If you're not receiving a valid nav signal, this area will go blank. So now that we know the nuts and bolts of how the equipment works, let's talk about how to use it in flight. We'll take a look at the procedures for navigating directly to a VOR and then tracking a specific radial to and from the station, and then talk a little about Victor Airways. We'll then take a look at a sample cross-country flight using all of those techniques. So the most basic function you can do with a VOR is to fly directly to it. So here's the procedure for navigating directly to a VOR. First, you want to tune in the VOR frequency on your nav radio and identify the station. Uh, although, again, in the 152, since the audio panel won't allow you to turn it off, that's fine if you don't want to identify it. Then you want to rotate your OBS knob until the CDI is centered and you have a to indication on your to from indicator. Once you do that, the bearing at the top of the Omni bearing ring is the heading that you want to use to navigate directly to that station. So uh, fly that heading. You'll need to apply wind correction if you have any winds in Flight Simulator. And you can do this either by using a flight computer app to calculate, calculate the wind correction, or you can use a technique called bracketing which is where you turn a, a small correction, use a small correction initially, say five or 10 degrees, and see if that holds the needle steady. And if it does, that's the heading you need to fly to keep the needle in the center. And uh, then you can make corrections left or right of that heading. And if you know that heading does not hold the needle centered, then you'll use a slightly larger correction and just go you know, right or left five degrees of that until you find a heading that keeps the needle in the center. You need to make corrections to keep the CDI centered. And remember that as you get closer to the VOR, the CDI will become more sensitive and you'll need to use smaller corrections. When you're uh, fairly far away, say 20 or 30 miles away from the VOR, you can make, use corrections of you know between 10 and 30 degrees uh, is, not, uh, is acceptable and uh, should uh, help you to keep the CDI in the center. And as you get closer to the station, though, uh, the needle is going to swing a little bit faster. So using 
you know, corrections between 5 and 15 degrees is a little bit better uh, to keep it uh, in the center. And as you get closer and closer to the station, you know, your corrections will need to become smaller and smaller. Another thing you can do with a VOR is use it to quickly identify where you are relative to that station by seeing what radial that you're on. And so here's the procedure for identifying what radial you're on. Again, you want to tune the VOR frequency and identify the station if you're not flying the 152. Uh, you want to rotate the OBS knob until the CDI is centered. If you have a two indication on your two from indicator, then the number at the bottom of the ring at the little yellow arrow indicates what radial you're currently located on. And the number at the top of the ring indicates what heading you should fly if you want to navigate towards the station. If you've centered the CDI and you have a from indication, then the number at the top of the ring indicates what radial you're currently on. Uh, but you do not want to try to navigate to the station uh, with a from indication because this will give you what's called reverse sensing, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. If you decide you want to navigate to the station, then uh, recenter the CDI with a two indication. So the two other things we can do with a VOR are navigate on a specific radial to or from the station, and we'll talk about the procedure for navigating on a specific radial from a VOR first. So again, you'll want to tune the VOR frequency in the nav radio and identify it if you're not flying the 152. And then rotate the OBS knob so that the desired radial is at the top of the ring at the big yellow triangle. Uh, so if you want to intercept the 270 degree radial, you'll want the uh, 27 up at the top of the ring. Then you want to verify that your uh, from arrow is displayed on the to from indicator. And then you want to make a turn to intercept the radial in the direction that the CDI is deflected. So if the CDI is off to the right, you need to make a turn to the right to intercept uh, that radial. Now, how much of a turn depends on how far away from the VOR that you are and how far off the radial that you are. It's not a bad idea, I, idea to identify what radial you're on first so that you have some uh, idea of how far off your desired radial you are, and the further off you are from that radial, the bigger intercept you'll wanna take. Also, if you're within just a few miles of the VOR, if you just passed over the VOR, you want to use a relatively small uh, intercept angle. Uh, so probably no more than about 10 or 20 degrees when you're close to the VOR and or close to the radial. Um, if you're far off the radial, you can use up to 90 degrees off the uh, that radial to intercept it. That will be your fastest way to intercept. But if you try to do that when you're either real close to the radial or real close to the station, you'll blow through that radial in about three seconds. Uh, it'll swing across very quickly and you'll have to go back and turn the other way to re-intercept. Once, you're, once you've got your CDI center, then you want to fly the heading at the top of the ring plus any uh, necessary wind correction if you're flying in uh, any winds and then make corrections as necessary to keep the CDI centered. So to navigate uh, on a specific radial to a VOR, here is the procedure for that. Uh, again, tune the VOR frequency and identify the station if you're not flying on 152. Rotate the OBS knob so that the reciprocal course for the desired radial is at the top of the ring. That is the uh, course that is opposite on the compass rows, and we'll talk in more detail about that here in just a little bit. Verify that two is displayed on the two from indicator. Uh, make a turn to intercept the radial in the direction of the CDI deflection. Again, uh, you know, 10 to 20 degrees if you're fairly close to the radial or the, or the station, and a little more than that if you're a little uh, further off. And then uh, once you, the CDI is centered, fly the heading at the top of the ring, plus any necessary wind correction, and uh, make corrections as necessary to keep the CDI centered, and that will take you to the VOR. So let's talk a little bit about reciprocals. You've probably noticed that when you're tracking away from a VOR, the heading you need to fly to track that radial will be the same as the radial itself. But to track a radial inbound to a VOR, you'll need to fly the reciprocal heading or the heading that's opposite to it on the compass rows. This makes sense if you visualize it. If you're west of a station or on the 270 degree radial, in order to fly to the VOR, 
you need to fly east or a 090 degree heading. If you want to track the 270 degree radial outbound or fly west away from the station, you want to fly a heading of 270. So as we mentioned earlier, reciprocal headings or courses are simply the headings or courses that are on the opposite side of the compass rows or 180 degrees away from any given heading or course. For example, the reciprocal of north or 360 is going to be south or 180. The reciprocal of west or 270 is going to be east or 090 and vice versa. Uh, the reciprocal of 300 degrees is going to be 120 degrees. Another way to get the reciprocal if you don't have a compass rose handy is simply to add or subtract 180, whichever gives you more than zero but less than 360. For example, if I want to find the reciprocal of 125, I can't subtract 180 because that would give me less than zero. So I add 180 and that gives me 305. And if I want to get the reciprocal of 252, I can't add 180 because that would give me more than 360. So I subtract 180 and I get 072. If you try to do it backwards, for example, if you try to fly inbound on the 270 degree radial with 270 uh, dialed into your omni bearing ring, you're going to get what's called reverse sensing. This means that the CDI will indicate the opposite from where you are in relation to the course. For example, if the CDI indicates that the course is to the left of your aircraft, it's actually to the right. And if you try to make a left turn to get the CDI centered back up, the needle's actually going to move farther away. To prevent reverse sensing, there are a couple of basic rules that you want to follow. First of all, the bearing at the top of your Omni bearing ring should always be about the same as your heading uh, that you're flying to navigate on that radial. If it's opposite from the direction you're traveling, you're going to get reverse sensing. You also want to have a two flag when you're flying towards a station and a from flag uh, if you're navigating away from it. Now let's talk a little bit about VOR airways or Victor airways. Victor Airways are air routes that follow specific VOR radials and generally travel between VORs, though there are some Victor Airways that uh, have a turn point at other than a VOR, usually at an intersection where two radials from two different VORs intersect. For example, Victor 534, which travels between uh, Little Rock VOR and Fort Smith VOR, instead of going directly between the two VORs, it travels up to Hawk Intersection, uh, over Russellville, Arkansas, and then uh, makes a turn and continues to Fort Smith VOR. Victor Airways are depicted as shaded blue lines coming off VORs on VFR charts and are designated with a V followed by a number. Under the airway designation number, a number in a blue box tells you the distance between VORs on that segment of the airway. Those segments that do not go VOR to VOR, like our previous example, do not list the distance. The outbound radial that defines the airway is listed outside the VOR compass rows with a small arrow. So we'll take a look at an example here, Victor uh, 16, which runs between Pine Bluff VOR and Marvell VOR. And uh, we can see in the middle of the airway, it shows us the airway designation. So this is Victor 16. Underneath that, it has the blue box with the numbers. So the distance between Pine Bluff and Marvel VOR is 65 nautical miles. And then we, flee, we look at the uh, compass rows for Pine Bluff just outside that. It tells us that the outbound radial that defines this airway is the 068 uh, radial off of Pine Bluff and the radial that defines it off of Marvell VOR is uh, the 252 degree radial outbound. To fly a Victor Airway, simply fly the VOR radial that defines that airway outbound or inbound from the depicted VOR. Generally, when flying VFR, you can switch between the VORs and radials that define the airway when you're halfway between the VORs. Note that even on airways that don't have an obvious turn, the radials that define the route may be slightly different for each VOR. For example, for Victor 16 going out of Pine Bluff, the outbound radial from Pine Bluff is 068, and the outbound radial from Marvell is 252. 
And if we do the reciprocal on that, that's actually a 072 heading inbound. Uh, so there's about a four degree difference between the two radials. And again, that happens about in the midway point of the airway. Most airway segments are short enough that you will be able to receive the appropriate VOR as long as you're at least 1,000 feet AGL. And you should be able to receive the appropriate VOR on longer segments if you're above 5,000 feet AGL. There are also intersections along airways that can be identified with cross radials from VORs that do not define the route. For example, if I'm navigating on Victor 54 between uh, Marvell VOR and Little Rock VOR, uh, when I get just to the south um, west of Clarendon, there's an intersection with another airway here. And so if I am tracking the 274 degree radial off of Marvel VOR, if I use a second VOR and dial up the 043 degree radial, uh, when that needle centers up, I know that I'm at this intersection right here. Likewise, if I continue on and then I dial up the 034 degree radial from Pine Bluff, when that needle centers up there, I know I'm at this intersection uh, here just to the north of Stuttgart. These intersections are typically not named on VFR charts, but they do have five letter designations. These were actually just recently remo removed uh, from the VFR charts, unless they're a major turn point in the airway. But you can find these identifiers on IFR charts. IFR charts also give more information about how high you need to be to get obstacle clearance and VOR receptions on a particular airway and where to change which VOR you're navigating off of if it's other than the midpoint of the airway. So let's take a look at a sample cross-country flight where we can demonstrate some of the techniques of VOR navigation we just learned. Our flight will take us from Pine Bluff to Helena, Arkansas, or KHEE, then to Hot Springs, or KHOT, via Little Rock VOR, then directly from Hot Springs back to Pine Bluff VOR and then to the airport. On the first leg, we'll take off and head southbound, climbing to our cruise altitude before we turn around to the north and practice tracking direct to the Pine Bluff VOR. We'll then pass over the station and track Victor 16 to Helena, where we'll make a landing. On the second leg, we'll track Victor 54 to Little Rock VOR, then track Victor 124 or 573 down to Hot Springs for a landing. We'll also take a look at using crossing radials to get a position fix on this leg. On the final leg between Hot Springs and Pine Bluff, there is no airway between the airports or VORs. So we'll look at tracking a radial outbound from Hot Springs VOR towards Pine Bluff until we can receive Pine Bluff VOR then tracking a radial inbound to that station and then landing back at Pine Bluff Airport. As far as setting up for the flight, it will be our pretty standard setup for the training flights. You do want the Cessna 152. Uh, as far as weight and balance goes, you want your two 170 pound passengers and you do want uh, two full tanks of gas. We do want to leave out of Pine Bluff KBF, KPBF and you want to use runway 18. Uh, we are going to take off and head southbound, climb up to about 3,500 feet before we turn around and start navigating to the VOR. If you'd like, you can actually set the destination. You can enter each leg of the flight plan. So you'd want KHEE -E in here for the first leg, and you could put the route in as uh, Pine Bluff, direct Pine Bluff VOR, and then you could put direct Marvel in there, and then uh, uh, direct to the uh, airport at uh, Helena. Uh, if you want something to look at on your VFR map to see how you're doing as far as staying on course with your VOR tracking. Uh, so that is an option. I'm not going to put that in there um, personally, uh, but if you want to do that, that's an option for you. As far as the time and date, I do recommend sticking with the June day at uh, noon, and then we'll set up the weather once we actually get into the flight simulator. As far as setting up the weather goes, I do recommend getting rid of the wind layer unless you're wanting to deal with uh, crosswinds and uh, also setting the temperature to a little more realistic value for uh, summer. And then uh, if you want to up the difficulty level a little bit and uh, do something a little more than severe clear, you can pump the aerosol density up to about eight and those will give you kind of a nice uh, haze layer 
Uh, it's still VFR visibility, it's still legal VFR, but it is not the severe clear we've been flying with so far on our previous cross-country flights. So that ups, ups the challenge level just a little bit uh, if you're wanting to uh, practice your electronic navigation under a little different and more challenging conditions. You can also add a layer of clouds if you want. Uh, I generally put the, you want the bottom uh, at a higher altitude than you'll be cruising at. Uh, so you're not actually in the clouds since you're flying VFR. And then generally you want to put the uh, altitude at the top of the clouds about three to 4,000 feet above that. So somewhere between, uh, let's see, you've got the bottom set at 75. So between 10.5 and 11.5 on the tops. And then uh, increase the scatter to 100%. That'll give you a nice puffy layer of cumulus clouds. And then uh, increase the coverage to somewhere around 25, 30%. will give you a nice layer of cumulus clouds if you want to fly with that. Uh, so that is uh, good weather settings for practicing the VOR navigation. But again, you can do this in severe clear if you'd like to as well. To fly the first leg, take off from runway 18 in Pine Bluff. Again, I recommend climbing on a southbound heading until leveling at your cruise altitude of 3,500 feet. This is both to give you some distance from the VOR to practice tracking direct and so you don't have to mess with the VOR and the climb. If you want to turn earlier and start tracking the VOR in the climb, that's up to you. Once you've leveled at 3,500 feet, gotten your aircraft in trim, and accomplished your cruise checklist, make a turn to a heading of 360 to set up to track to the VOR. All right, so we've got ourselves level at 3,500 feet. We turn back around to the north. In fact, we can see uh, Pine Bluff Airport uh, up to the north, just off to the left side of the nose here. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and take a closer look at the panel. Uh, and we'll go ahead and start uh, practicing or uh, setting up to track direct to the VOR. So I have my frequency dialed in. We'll say that I have identified it. And now what I need to do is I need to center the CDI needle with a two indication. Uh, so I will dial it until that needle centers up. And we can see the needle moving in there. Uh, so the needle is pretty well centered up on, uh, looks like a 355 heading. So I need to take up a 355 heading uh, to track directly to the VOR from my present position. So I'll take up that heading. I'll probably actually put in about a 360 heading and see if I get that needle completely centered up. And uh, then I'll turn back to that 355 heading and see if that will keep that centered. And then I will just make uh, smaller and smaller corrections as I get closer and closer to the station. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to actually pass over the station. We're gonna fly right over the VOR and then we're gonna take up the 068 degree radial outbound, which is the radial we want for Victor 16 going out towards Helena. Uh, so we know that we've passed the station once the two, front, two flag flips to a from flag. So once we pass the station, we'll turn to that 068 heading. We'll turn the OBS to the 068 radials because we're gonna to wanna to track that outbound. And then after that, we'll make any turns we need to intercept the course and uh, fly outbound on that radial and track that radial outbound. And as we're getting closer to the station, uh, the needle starts to move a little bit more uh, as it gets a little more sensitive. So I'm still going to make those small corrections uh, to try to keep that in the center. Uh, until I pass the station, which I know I pass the station when that two from flag flips. And the closer you get to the station, the more ne sensitive the needle is going to get. And at some point, uh, it's going to be hard to keep it in the center and you don't want to wind up chasing the needle. Uh, so at that point, it's better to just hold the heading that you know will take you fairly close to the VOR. And uh, you can see it's every little change I make right now is making it wiggle just a little bit. Uh, so make small corrections, but uh, you know don't make big heading changes to try to keep the needle in the center because you can see just a couple degrees of heading is uh, making a relatively large change. So that means I'm almost probably right over the top of the station. So it looks like right now I'm just going to hold that heading. There's the uh, flag flipping. It's gone to an off flag. And now it's gone to a from flag, so I'll go ahead and roll over to that 068 heading. 
While I'm doing that, I'll go ahead and roll in that 06A course on the OBS, and then I'll make a turn to intercept that uh, on the way out of the, uh, away from the station here. All right, so basically now I'm paralleling the, uh, the radial outbound. I am to the right, of course, so I need to make a little bit of a correction. So I'll fly maybe a 10 degree or so correction and see if that will bring in the needle. The other thing that I want to do is look at the time uh, because I know that this leg is 65 miles long and I want to switch over to the other VOR halfway through, so about uh, 32 and a half miles. That's going to be about 20 minutes, uh, so it's uh, three seven or uh, 17 after, so at about uh, 37 after is when I want to flip over uh, to the next VOR. And again, you do want to be a little patient once you've crossed a VOR, you don't want to end up chasing the needle. If I take an overly aggressive intercept here, the needle's going to come across very quickly and I can easily end up doing S turns about a needle. So I've got about a 10 or 15 degree intercept uh, to get that needle to come back in here. You can see it's coming in slowly. That's about the speed I want it to come in. And then once it's centered up, I'll take up that 068 heading uh, to keep the CDI in the center. So now I've got base the CDI basically centered up. That's right in the middle of that circle there. So I'll go and turn back to my 068 heading and then I'll make corrections to keep it in the center as I track it. Uh, outbound on this radial and again when I get to that halfway point about uh, 37 minutes past the hour uh, then I know it's time to start tracking inbound on the radio to Marvell VOR. Of course there's no rule that says I can't go ahead and tune in my next VOR and start seeing to see if I am receiving it. Uh, so I'll go ahead and dial that up. Marvell VOR is 109.6 so I'll put that in my active uh, I want to track inbound on the 252 radial once I get there, uh, so I'm going to dial in the reciprocal course, uh, which is 072, and we can see it does look like we are picking that VR up, but we're not yet on that radial, uh, so we will just see, oops, actually, you know, I've got the wrong radial dot, and I've got the 052, so we will dial that over to the 072, and it looks like we're actually pretty close to on course already. So once we get to about uh, 37 minutes past the hour, uh, we'll go ahead and start using this as our primary source of navigation. Until then, we still need to be navigating off the Pine Bluff VOR. And there's about uh, 37 minutes past the hour, and so that's about the halfway point. So we will start navigating off of Marvell instead of Pine Bluff VOR. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and switch that into the number one nav. And then I'm going to go ahead and dial in that 072 course. That's a little too much there. There we go. So I'm just a little bit uh, right, of course. And I'm also going to dial a frequency into the bottom nav radio uh, that will uh, deactivate it, basically, and get it to center up with the off flags. That way I don't pay attention to the wrong VOR accidentally. Uh, just because you're flying uh, on VORs doesn't mean you can't look out the window when you're VFR and try to find landmarks. And we know if we look at the sectional chart that about halfway through we should be crossing, crossing the White River and there indeed is the White River right out there. So now all we need to do is keep the needle centered for this course to Marvell VOR and uh, uh, here in about 20 minutes we should be uh, approaching uh, Helena Airport and then probably in about uh, 15 minutes or so is when we want to start down about a thousand feet to uh, do our crossover midfield for the landing there at Helena. And looking at my clock now, it's about 52 minutes past the hour. So uh, if the first half of the flight took 20 minutes, it stands to reason that the back half of the flight is going to take uh, 20 minutes. So I'm about at the point where I want to start down uh, to a thousand feet above pattern altitude, about 2,200 feet uh, to make the pattern entry there in Helena. And I can also see, looking out the window here, that it looks like the Mississippi River is right up there. And I know that Helena is right on the Mississippi River. So I know I'm getting fairly close. I just need to uh, keep my eye out uh, for the airport now and uh, make that pattern entry. As in, and as I'm in my descent, just like with the other cross-country flights, I use my clues to try to find the airport. I can see the town of Helena is right over here.
I know that the airport is to the north and uh, west of the town. And it looks like we have a, a south-facing runway right there and an east-west runway right there. I'm going to go ahead and cross over midfield at about 2,200 feet uh, to make a left downwind for runway 18, I believe it is. And then we'll make the landing there at Helena. And uh, you'll notice that the uh, VOR is located directly on the field at Helena, uh, so it will take us right to the airport. But you need to look on the chart and make sure that uh, you know, if you're navigating to VOR, where it is, sometimes they're not located exactly on the airport. So you may have to travel from the VOR to the airport and you need to be aware of where the airport is in relation to the VOR. Once the field is in sight, it's just a matter of making a normal pattern entry to a normal landing. You can then taxi to the ramp to take a break or taxi back to the runway for the next leg. And before we take off on the next leg, uh, there's a few things we can do to set up for our next leg before we take off. Uh, we want to make sure that we still have Marvell VOR dialed in there, 109.6, that's in there. And it's a good idea to go ahead and set up our um, outbound radial. We're going to be tracking uh, outbound from the VOR, so we do want the radial heading in there of 274. You might be asking, well, how do you know if you're on 274 because those things are, the little tick marks are so small. Luckily, when you uh, dial one click in Flight Simulator, uh, you know that you're moving one degree because you can see it's right on top of the 275 here. And if I click one, two, three, four, and five, it's right on top of the 270 here. And this is not something you can do in a real airplane, so it's kind of a nice feature. So I just uh, dial until I've completely covered up that 275 and then dial one to the left of that. That's the 274 degree radial. So I've got all that set up on the ground and all I have to do now is take off and intercept that radial. We'll do a takeoff from runway run 18 and then I'll make a right crosswind turnout. So I'll turn a heading of 275. This will uh, put us probably south of the uh, radial initially and we'll parallel the course and then we can make like a 10 or 15 degree uh, turn to intercept once we take off. For the second leg, take off from runway 17 at Helena. At 500 feet above the ground, you can make a right crosswind turn to exit the pattern as you climb to your cruise altitude of 4,500 feet. So as I'm climbing out of the traffic pattern here, I'm on my crosswind heading of about 270 and uh, the radial's up to the north of me. This makes sense. If I took off heading to the south and then turned west, then the uh, 274 radial is going to be up to the north. So I'll just make a uh, small intercept turn, probably about uh, 15 degrees. I'll take up a heading of about 290. And uh, we're fairly close to the VOR, so that should get me uh, onto the radial uh, fairly quickly. And there we can see the radial is starting to move off of the full scale deflection position and over towards the center. And so once it centers up, I'll take up that heading of about 274 and keep it in the center and track it uh, about uh, 24 minutes is what it should take to get to the midpoint of the airway. And then we can start tracking off of Little Rock VOR. So there it's pretty well centered up. So I'll go ahead and take up my uh, heading of about 274 and then just make small corrections to keep it in the center as I track out uh, towards Little Rock. And as usual, when you reach your cruise altitude, go ahead and level out, trim out, and perform your cruise checklist. Okay, so we're tracking outbound on that 274 radial, the one that defines uh, Victor 54 over to Little Rock, and about 34 minutes past the hour, we won't know that we'll be at the midpoint, and we'll switch over to tracking uh, Little Rock VOR rather than Marvell. Uh, in the meantime, let's take a look at uh, getting a position fix using cross radials. So I am going to dial uh, Pine Bluff VOR up into the number two nav, and I'm just going to tune in and see what radial I'm on. So I have a from indication right here, and so I'll just dial it up until I get the needle centered here, and it looks like I'm on about the zero, looks like about the zero six zero degree radial right now. So if I take a look at the map, I can kind of plot where the 060 degree radial goes up from Pine Bluff and where it intersects the 274 radial or Victor 54 off of uh, Marvell. And that is my current position. So that's a way to get a fix and know where you are uh, on the, on the uh, 
airway and where you are in the world. You can do this with two uh, radios, just two different VORs, even if you're not on an airway, and get a position fix. And so the next thing I'm going to do is, uh, as we go up the road here, we've got an intersection with uh, Victor 47 coming up here, and that's the 034 degree radial off of Pine Bluff. So I will go ahead and set that in there. And uh, we know once I cross that 034 radial uh, that, that, that we have arrived at uh, that intersection, which is just north of Clarendon Airport. And this picture makes sense, at, sense here if you think about your aircraft is pointing to the west here. Uh, so the radial is in front of us right now. So that's how you want to kind of visualize that. And actually, it's uh, Victor 16 is off the 043 degree radial, so I misspoke on that. So I've got that dialed in there now, and so you can see it is coming alive right now. Looks like we are about uh, 2, 4, 6, 7 degrees off from that right now. Uh, so, and we are roughly 20, 30 miles away from Pine Bluff, so uh, that's going to come in slowly uh, since the radials are spaced fairly far apart uh, at this point. But uh, once that centers up, we know that we are at that intersection and we should be just north of Clarendon Airport, which we may or may not see. It's very close to the airway, uh, so it may be difficult to see and it's also a very small runway. So we'll just con keep, continue to keep tracking and here in about five minutes or so, it'll be time to switch over to Little Rock VOR and start tracking inbound to Little Rock VOR. Okay, so that radial has centered up there. So we know that we are at that intersection now uh, right just to the uh, east, excuse me, west-southwest of the Clarendon Airport. And we're also coming up on 34 past the hour, so I'm going to start dialing in Little Rock VOR in number two nav now, now that we've made that position fix. Uh, so I'll dial up 13.9, and we want to track the uh, 089 degree radial end, so that's actually going to be, we're tracking inbound, so we need the reciprocal. The reciprocal is going to be 269. So I will dial in uh, 269 and we'll see how we're doing there. And looking at that, looks like we are about centered up. That's 34 past the hour. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer that up to number one nav. And uh, we'll start tracking that inbound to Little Rock. And then we will set up uh, for another cross radial identification. So there's 269. Uh, to Little Rock out inbound. I'm just slightly left of course. I'll turn about a heading of uh, 280 to try to get that, needle, get that needle centered up. And then I'm going to put uh, Pine Bluff back on the bottom uh, VOR and I'm going to set that up to identify the 034 degree radial which is Victor uh, 69 coming out of Pine Bluff. And uh, so we'll set that up to ID and make a position fix off of that. All right, so I've got the uh, 269 uh, course inbound, the 089 degree radial outbound from Little Rock that we are tracking inbound on right now. And I put the 034 degree radial out of Pine Bluff uh, so I can get that uh, position fixed just to the uh, northeast of Stuttgart. And uh, it is coming in here, so here in about another minute or so, uh, we're going to be at that intersection. All right, so that radial is centered up and sliding past now, so it looks like I'm at that intersection and uh, just passing beyond it. And if I take a look out the window over here, there is Stuttgart Airport right where it's supposed to be. Uh, so again, you're going VFR, so use all of your tools to determine your position. Uh, we've got a position fix using the VOR, and then we look out the window and see a position fix uh, by looking at a nearby airport. You don't necessarily have to do uh, position fixes off of airways. You can do them off of uh, radials uh, that are not charted. Uh, so I'm actually going to put in the 360 degree radial off of Pine Bluff and uh, get a position fix off of that. Uh, so we'll know uh, once we cross through that radial, we'll know we're due north of Pine Bluff and can kind of fix our position on the chart. And we can see the uh, needle starting to come off the wall, so that means I'm approaching that cross radial there. And as soon as it centers up, we know that I'm at the uh, 360 degree radial off of Pine Bluff, uh, so I can know where my position is on this Victor Airway since I am still pretty well centered up on the uh, uh, radial inbound to Little Rock. All right, so there the 360 degree radial is coming through the center there, so I know my position is at that 360 degree radial on uh, 
Victor 54 going into Little Rock, and I can even kind of measure that out. It looks like that's about uh, about 10 miles away or so from the VOR. And I can actually, if I look out here, I can kind of see the Arkansas River coming up from the south. And so Little Rock's going to be right over there, and then the airport's going to be to the south of that. So I'll continue to track this uh, two, excuse me, the uh, 089 degree radial inbound to Little Rock. And I will pass over the station, and then I'm going to take up the uh, 250 degree radial after I pass the station so that we take up Victor 124, Victor 573 uh, outbound to Hot Springs. And you notice I got just a little bit left of the course, and so I'm taking up about a 10 degree correction. Uh, to get myself back on to the center there. And again, as I get closer and closer to the VOR, it's going to become more and more sensitive. You can see with just 10 degrees, it's moving at a noticeable pace to where it's uh, we can see that it's coming into the center. And uh, so smaller and smaller corrections as you get closer and closer to the VOR, and then don't chase the needle once you get right over the VOR. And I'm approaching uh, Little Rock. I can see the city right over here, and I can see Little Rock National Airport right over there. And I know that the VOR is to the south and east of the field. And looking at the sectional, it's just on the other side of the river. So I expect once I cross the river, I will probably get station passage. Uh, so once I do that, again, I'm going to make small corrections right now to try to keep the needle as close to the center as I can, knowing that as I get closer and closer to the VOR, it's going to become more and more difficult to do. And it's not necessarily to pass right over the top of the station, but that's what you should always aim for. And uh, so I'll do that to try to keep the needle in the center, and uh, once it flips over, I'll turn to that outbound heading of 250, I'll dial in that new radial, and then they'll intercept that new radial. I also want to take note of the time. That next leg is 47 minutes, or 47 miles, so if I divide that in half uh, and uh, work out the time to fly, about half of that leg it's going to be about 15 minutes, so about 15 minutes after I pass Little Rock VOR, I want to uh, switch over to Hot Springs VOR and dial up the uh, inbound radial down there at Hot Springs. All right, so there the, uh, the needle has gone blank. That just means I'm over the top of the station. This is what's called the cone of confusion where the signal doesn't go straight up. Uh, so we get no signal there for just a second as we're passing over the top of the uh, station. And then I'll go ahead and turn to that outbound heading of 250. And then I will dial in that new radial and uh, I will intercept that radial and track it down towards Pine Bluff. So there's the 250 degree radial. I've dialed that in and I'm pretty, much, pretty well on it. I uh, overshot my heading by a little bit there. I uh, went over to about a 240 heading. But just small corrections, just like I was doing to track to the VOR on the other side of the station. Now I want to do those small corrections to center up that VOR. And it looks like I passed over right at 1 o'clock. So at about 1.15, I want to go ahead and dial in uh, Hot Springs and, and, and navigate to that radial inbound to Hot Springs. I'm only about five minutes outside of Little Rock, but I did go ahead and tune up the Hot Springs VOR at 10.0. And uh, because the airway is only 47 nautical miles, I am receiving that at this point. I'm still going to navigate it primarily off the Little Rock VOR until I get to that uh, 14 or 15 minute point uh, down the road uh, just to do the halfway thing. But uh, technically at this point, if you wanted to navigate uh, directly to Hot Springs, then you could go ahead and start doing that. You just you know, need to make sure that you're pretty well on the radial the inbound if you want to maintain the airway. But you could navigate direct to the VOR as well if you wanted to do that. I'll also mention that the uh, radial inbound uh, to Pine Bluff, it's actually the 071 degree radial outbound. Uh, so again, if we're flying inbound uh, on an outbound radial, uh, we need to fly the reciprocal course. So I've got 251 dialed into the uh, Omni bearing ring on the bottom VOR. And again, once I get to about that uh, 14 or 15 minute point, that halfway point on the airway, I'll go ahead and switch over to Hot Springs VOR uh, and start navigating solely off of that. All right, so there's about the 14 minute mark there. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip over the number one nav over to Hot Springs and dial in the 251 degree radial, or excuse me, it's the zero. Uh, 71 degree radial is what I'm tracking, but I am tracking inbound. So I want the reciprocal course, which is 251. And then I'll go ahead and turn the other station to a station that's not uh, anything, so it will, be something I won't pay attention 
two anymore, and then I will go ahead and just track this uh, radial uh, into Hot Springs. And you'll notice that the uh, VOR there is located on the airport. And the way this radial comes in, it actually brings me in pretty well for a, a straight into runway two three. Uh, so as I get closer, I should be able to pick up the airport and make a uh, straight in approach to runway two three. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is here in about uh, seven minutes, so 14 plus seven, about 21 past the hour. That puts me about 12 miles out, and that's about where I want to start my descent uh, for the airport there at Hot Springs, since I have about 4,000 feet to lose to get to the runway there at uh, Hot Springs. All right, so there's about 20 minutes, 21 minutes past the hour, so I will go ahead and initiate my descent. Uh, coming down initially probably to about 1,500 feet or so as that's the traffic pattern altitude. Uh, but then I'll just make a straight in approach uh, into runway uh, 23 there at Hot Springs. I know the approach is going to be over here uh, because right now I'm flying a about a 250 heading and I need to be flying a 230 heading to be lined up with the runway. And then I just keep tracking this uh, VOR radial until I can get the airport in sight. It's going to take me straight to the field and then I'll maneuver to line up with the runway for that visual approach. And as I get closer I start to pick up visual clues. I know that the uh, airport is to the south of the city. I also know it's to the north of this lake up here and so it looks like that's the airport over there. In fact I think I see runway 23 running this way uh, so I'll probably maneuver over here being cognizant of this terrain over here. Uh, for that straight in approach to runway uh, 23. And uh, I can continue to track the uh, VOR until I can see it, uh, but just remember it's going to get continuously more sensitive as I get closer and closer. At this point, I've got a pretty good visual on the runway, so I'm just going to go ahead and maneuver over there uh, for that straight in approach to runway 23. So after maneuvering for the straight in landing, you can again taxi to the ramp to take a break or taxi back to runway 23 for the final leg. All right, so we're ready for that final leg between Hot Springs and Pine Bluff. And there's just a few things I wanna talk about before we get airborne on this leg. Uh, first off is that uh, you can refuel at each landing stop if you want to, uh, but the 152 does have enough range to do all three legs without refueling as long as you're properly leaning the mixture when you cruise. Uh, so take a look at your fuel tanks. You'll notice we're just above half a tank. It's only about a 60 to 65 nautical mile leg back to Pine Bluff, so that's uh, plenty of gas to get us back to Pine Bluff. Uh, so for this route, we're going to uh, fly between Hot Springs VOR and Pine Bluff VOR. There is no airway between these two VORs, so we have to determine what radios we're going to fly by plotting the course on the map. So we'll plot a course from Hot Springs Airport to Pine Bluff VOR and then down to Pine Bluff Airport. And the reason we can do it between the Hot Springs Airport and the Pine Bluff VOR is because the VOR at Hot Springs is located on the airport. When we plot that course, uh, we see that we get a 102 course outbound from Hot Springs. So it should be about the 102 degree radial from Hot Springs that we want to track outbound uh, to get headed towards Pine Bluff. It's a 60 nautical mile leg, so at about 30 nautical miles, we'll want to uh, switch over to the Pine Bluff VOR. And it looks like the Pine Bluff VOR, the radial we're going to track inbound there, is going to be the 279 degree radial. And again, that's an inbound radial or we're going to we're going to track that radial inbound so we'll fly the reciprocal course uh, so that's going to be a 099 degree course to fly inbound uh, to pine bluff again the leg between the two vors is about 60 nautical miles uh, so if we cut that in half that's about 30 nautical miles uh, so it's about 18 minutes um, between at the the halfway point will be 18 minutes uh, after we depart Pine Bluff, roughly 18 to 20 minutes. So we'll take a look at what time we actually start rolling in Pine Bluff, and then 18 to 20 minutes after that is when we will start tracking inbound to the Pine Bluff VOR. And I went ahead and set up, set up our VOR radios for this uh, flight. I've got uh, 110.0, which is the Hot Springs VOR, and the active on number one. I've got that 102 course uh, already set up there for tracking that radial outbound from the Hot Springs VOR. And then I've got 116.0 uh, set up in the standby for number two. And I've got the uh, 099 course 
uh, set up in there to track that course inbound uh, to Pine Bluff. So with that, we'll perform a quick before takeoff checklist and we'll go ahead and get airborne. For the final leg, take off on runway 23 at Hot Springs. At 500 feet above the field, turn a left crosswind to depart the pattern. After clearing pattern altitude, make a turn about 10 or 20 degrees left of the VOR course to intercept the radial outbound from the Hot Springs VOR. As we can see, as we level off here, uh, the course is starting to come in, so we'll level off at 3,500 feet. And as the course centers up, we'll go ahead and turn to our course heading uh, to intercept and track that course. All right, so we're a little over uh, 10 minutes after takeoff from Pine Bluff, and we're just tracking that radial outbound from uh, Hot Springs. I did go ahead and dial up the radial from uh, Pine Bluff, and uh, we are receiving that, but we'll wait until the halfway point uh, to flip over and start making that our primary navigation source. Uh, so we took off at 15, 18 minutes past that would be the halfway point, 18 to 20 because the climb speed was not 100 knots. Uh, so somewhere between 23 and 25 minutes, or excuse me, 33 and 35 minutes past the hour is where we can start to, where we can flip over to uh, the Pine Bluff VOR and track that one inbound. Uh, so we'll just uh, keep this in the center using our small corrections. Uh, for now and then at that halfway point flip over and start navigating to Pine Bluff. Alright so there's about 34 minutes past the hour we'll split the difference and so we'll go ahead and flip over to the Pine Bluff VOR. We'll dial in the 099 degree radial and we can see we're pretty close we'll just make a little bit of a correction to keep it in the center here and then we'll just track that to the VOR. We'll notice if we look at the chart that the uh, VOR is north of the field by about four nautical miles so what we can do is uh, to make our approach is we can fly right over the VOR and then turn south and we should be able to see the field from there. Or, you know, if you get the field in sight prior to that, you can just maneuver for a landing once you've got the field in sight and don't have to go to the VOR. Uh, so we'll just track to the VOR, see what we can see. And then here in about uh, 10 minutes, that'll put us about five miles away from the VOR. And we can go ahead and start our descent into the traffic pattern there at uh, Pine Bluff. All right, so I've leveled it off at traffic pattern altitude, getting pretty close to the VOR. In fact, I think that's uh, probably the VOR station right out there, what uh, the flight simulator thinks a VOR station looks like. Uh, so we know that the airport is to the south of uh, the VOR. So if I take a look out there, uh, we can actually see the approach lights for runway 18. So I'll go ahead and make my turn south, and we'll make a, a straight in landing at runway 18. So that concludes this lesson on VOR navigation. Hopefully it's given you a good grasp on the fundamentals of using these stations. As always, if you enjoy the content, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.